what is brand building, it's truthfully telling, it's, it's just, it's really storytelling. And that's what it is. And we're hearing that word more and more from the last year because of social media, because of platforms like Snapchat and Instagram. But storytelling has been around for years. We just have more exposure to it because we are so used to seeing something different that we don't realize it's the basic four keys of marketing that is back into what, um, what, what, uh, what we're doing today with the social media space. For example, I'm going, to talk, uh, I'm going to talk about Pepsi as an example, only not because I work for Pepsi or I like Pepsi or I drink Pepsi, it's just because I personally have loved their commercials over the years and I love what they do with their Instagram accounts as well. Um, what will we, I'll just move back and forth, okay. So what we've noticed about Pepsi is that they always use influencers. So does anybody remember the Madonna Pepsi commercial way back in the day when her song Like a Prayer came out and it was banned initially, right? You remember? I'm, I'm not that like young, but I still remember that. And what I liked about that, that ad is that they had the song, they had the dance, they had everything like the music video, but you just saw Pepsi's logo on the diners at that time of that, of that you know, generation or whatever it is. And the fact that even though they pulled that ad, people were doing exactly what we want people to do today. They were talking about it, they were conversing about it. If you heard the song Like a Prayer back then, you thought about that Pepsi can. So Pepsi was like, hey, you know what? We know this is a controversial song and a controversial music video, but we want in. So they took a stand and they stuck with it. Same thing if you notice what they did with Spice Girls. When Spice Girls came out, they were a phenomenon. They made a lifestyle of girl power. Pepsi got them to say their their commercial generation next and on all that girl power stuff. Teenagers, girls, even guys all went crazy about it. So again, they went with the trend of what was happening and they weren't afraid of that. Same thing with Britney Spears, Beyonce, and so forth. So if you really see all their commercials, um, it, there's not a set tone to it. But there's a set message. Whatever's happening, like they want to be in trend, they want to be in style. They're not afraid to, if if they make a mistake, like the like the Kendall Jenner ad, that was a big big PR mess. It was, but they owned up and said, "Hey guys, sorry, we fucked up. We didn't realize this was the reaction. We were gonna like 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 pull that ad." People spoke about it. Their sales did not drop. In fact, it went higher because people could trust that brand. So they are telling their story by sticking to what they believe in. Now, that's their YouTube story. If you go on Twitter, their conversations are different. If you go on Instagram, their conversations are different. Like, I am not a Pepsi drinker. When I see their Instagram stories and their Instagram ads, I want that bag of lace. So I may not drink Pepsi, but I want their, want their secondary product. And that's exactly what they're doing with their product or service. So you could have one main service or one main product that you offer that may not necessarily be your target market, but you end up having a niche market with your secondary product or services depending on creating your content to be very different on all your platforms. And that is, uh, and that is very difficult to do, but the reason I use Pepsi as an example is you really study how they're doing stuff on their different social media platforms. That is how they're making that movement. They're, voice was there before social media. They just they just adapted to what's happening in the market today. And that's really essentially um, what a lot of us should be doing. I mean, Pepsi also went with the whole app story with their emojis and things like that, right? I'm pretty sure at some point we had the stickers and we all were using their like, emojis to tweet or things like that. So they were kind of going with what's going on. And that's what we, we need to do, which I realize most of us don't really do it, even though we we should. Um, so yeah, so basically those are the b uh, main branding tips. If you take a stand, you stick with it. If you make a mistake, own up to it. Content should spark a conversation always. Um, not necessarily good conversation or bad conversation. You need to have people talking about what you're doing out there. If not, you do become ir irrelevant. Um, tell your story in a way where you aren't directly selling your product, basically. Because nobody wants the flyers and the videos that say buy, buy, sell, sell, two for one deals anymore. We, like, nobody wants to see that. 
Um, this leads us to what is the difference between personal and professional content. So if you're a startup, if you're a brand, if you're someone who's coming into the social media space today and you want to be an entrepreneur or you just or you have your 9 to 5 that you enjoy doing but you still want to have a presence online, you end up spending three to five years um, self-identifying self what is your voice on social media and which platform do you end up and sorry do you want to use? Um, which is fine. We all end up experimenting with it. It's about once you find how you want to present yourself on social media, you just need to stick with it. Despite the changes, despite the platform changes that happen all the time. For example, I still know people who love Snapchat with more than Instagram stories. But they're sticking with it and they're evolving and creating their presence through that platform versus jumping through six different platforms that they may not know how to use. Um, so once you know that, it's just a matter of now breaking down on your personal and your professional uh, content out there. Because today, if you apply for a job, if you want a client, people will go on your social media and see what you are all about. That's really what it is. It's not like the old times where we just send in a resume, we have a phone interview, and that's it. So they want to know what's your personality. So when it comes to your personal account, it comes down to how much do you want to ship? Are you always thinking like a business, or do you really not care about your social media presence? If you, in any point, want to have some sort of influence, if you want to attach yourself to a brand, if you want that brand to come to you, whether you might be a personal account, you are then again thinking like a business, which makes you want to have your personal account in a very business format. Now, if you are a, if you are a professional account, your tone becomes different because you're trying to sell your product or service without, without directly selling it to it. But if you own those accounts, how do you differ, differ, differentiate yourself um, from your personal and from your uh, professional account. And one of the examples I'm going to actually tell you guys to either go on your social media is if you look at the Instagram account of Toronto Fashion Academy, when you see what they present on their account, and if you go on one of their founders, Jason Cameron One, you guys to click on these, these accounts, what he's showing on his personal account, you won't even think he's an owner of a fashion academy very different. It's all about his life, his personal life, it's about his kids, everything. If you go on his on his business, which is the Fashion Academy, you see style shoots, you see what's happening next. So they're two very, very different accounts. Same person though. Exactly same person. So that would be a great example to kind of just look into how we're doing personal and professional content that's, that's out there. Um, another thing I would say is we all know about the Spice Girls, and if you look at them as a brand or as a group, they came onto the scene. They were branded from day one. You know, five girls, five different personalities, five different hair colors, five different styles, and that stuck with them for what 20, 20 years now. And there's no verified social media accounts for them yet. People still follow them. They still want them to come back. They still think about them all the time because they had a very distinct brand for themselves. I know, I'm very excited about my, my child is in love with them. <laughs> I'm still in love with them, it's okay. <laughs> That'd be part of my presentation. <laughs> but, but they do end up being someone that we learn marketing from. Just because when they started out, we didn't have social media, that does not mean what they did to become this, this lifestyle change does not, does not apply today. That we have more resources to get to that level. Because <coughs> everything's out there for us. Um, and the most fun part would be networking and your online presence. So I personally don't like to go to a lot of networking events, I'll be honest, but I do end up going to a lot of these events. And I meet, I meet amazing people, which after, I, after being lazy, I'm like, fine, I'll go, I end up having a great time and meeting all these people. And then I started working with a couple of networking organizations, so I, I do their events like management and marketing for them. And yesterday, I had someone tell me, so you specialize in networking events. And I'm like, not really. I specialize in, in managing your event. It could be any event, but I specialize in it. However, that person's perception of what I do was because of what content I'm like, putting out there on social media. 
right? I don't, I'm not specialized in networking event management, but this person talked so, and they wanted me to do something for them, but for them it was, this is your strength. And I'm like, no, just event management in that case is my strength. So your online presence is really what you want people to believe and how you want them to see you. Like, I've always been associated with fashion for some reason, whether it's fashion shows, fashion production, you know, some people think they have a marketing agency, and towards the end, it's like, oh yeah, you also do social media, right? It's quite the reverse. I actually work more with social media clients, less with the other, you know, shows and productions and, and things like that. So, if you want people to kind of change their perception about you, you have to then change what you're putting out there, the type of events you're going, and if, and if you want to go to all kinds of events and things like that and put it on your stories and your, and your social media, then you need to have that friend who's willing to make a fool of him or herself and say, okay, stand like this, do like that, let me put that, that, that content out there for you. Um, let me say no. I started doing that. A lot of things I started saying no because it does not resonate with uh, what I want to want to want to portray, and that is slowly changing. But yes, I definitely say networking does lead to a greater online presence. It does get you what you want. It gets you. You, you just need to know what it, what that is basically. And that's really the basis of this presentation. But I would like the fact that we have time to talk more because this is really more of a conversation presentation, less of like a, here's some tips and all that stuff. So questions, and I would love to go into more detail. Or talks, I should say. Is being talks. controversial usually better up or down? I think that's going to depend to what level you want to take it. Sometimes we do become controversial because we just want people to keep talking about it. But then, is your product... I'm thinking, so for instance, specifically, yesterday, Delta Airlines tweeted out that they're cutting all their relationship with the NRA. Mm -hmm. And so that's been retweeted now like about 30,000 times. Now, and yet I haven't seen it reported at all. So this is something that seems to be under the radar. I don't know if this is good or bad for them. It's not good for them. Because that, because that retweet is going around to people who, 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 it, who they are being affected by. But, what, but, in, but the way it's good for them is they're having people talk about it. They're having people have that conversation. They want people to, to reach out to them afterwards and deal with them. So, they're still, so their brand is still being in, in people's minds, good or bad. Right now, they've not, like even prior to that tweet yesterday, they don't have the best customer service response, nor, nor do a lot of customers like flying with them. There's always some issues with Delta. I mean, that's just from my own personal experience. Um, they're all bad. Sorry? They're all bad. Yeah, I've, I've had like the worst experience with them, though. Like, they're, they're, they're like, that Delta, Delta's that a special kind of worse. Yeah, it's a special <laughs> kind of worse. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So they have more reason to do something unconventional like this. It says, ignore the, ignore what happens to you at the gate. We're not talking to the NRA. Yeah, yeah because they know people will go first thing is because when people want to complain now, Twitter has become that customer service conversation platform. It's not Instagram, Facebook, or even sending an email. Like they know people will go on it, they will press at, and they will they will slam that brand for whatever it is and have a bunch of people who care about it going on and on about it on Twitter. They're still getting people to talk about it and have that attention, and they know it will come back to bite them, but they're doing a short-term PR movement versus something long-term. And that's also what brands need to like, like look into. Is it short-term or like long-term, right? So what about long-term inflammatory positions? So I'll give you an example. Wendy's constantly is attacking their rivals on Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, In a huge way. I, kind of, yes, but it's certainly, uh, it's certainly <coughs> not like a positive message. It's not a positive message, but their rivals are aware of the game plan. So here's a little insider tip for all these brands, like Wendy's, McDonald's, Tim Hortons, even um, Pepsi, Coke, oh. whatever. All these marketing um, uh, uh, VIPs, they plan this. They are aware that tomorrow their marketing social media will launch that attack. They will launch that campaign on them. Now, they take that stat because and there's a reason why their why their price points are always the same. If you walk into a store, Pepsi and Coke, if they always on, on special at the same time. 
you will never find Pepsi price higher than Coke or vice versa. It never happens. So same thing with like with, with Wendy's. If they know if their if their rivals are aware that this is Wendy's um, uh, uh, strategy online, and their rivals are working on their own strategy to make sure that they don't lose their customers or sales. So a lot of PR strategy, especially when it's controversial, is pre-planned. It's never just like, oh, okay, let me just deal with it. You know. I think like just going back to that, the, the Wendy's. It's, it's perfectly to Wendy's advantage because the demographic that they're targeting, that's how they speak, that's kind of how the, the jargon is, right? So to me, I think that's something that I've noticed lately on social media is changing, is that there's more of this type of conversation going on. And like with Facebook, Facebook uh, promotes more conversation now with this algorithm change, so mm -hmm. it leads into that as well, too, for them. It does, and Facebook and Facebook did that because last year what they saw is yes, all their all their business pages and that's what we were like um, uh, going after. But there was no engagement on social media. I'm mean, sorry, on their Facebook accounts. Like if you like, I'll be honest. I barely use my Facebook account. I hate going on Facebook. I just find it really boring. I don't have that desire to like, have a conversation. But I would love to be on my Instagram account because I can still have that engagement with someone. And I love to go on Twitter because there's so much happening out there that you that you are aware of. Which is, what, which is why Facebook did that change, um, so they can start bringing that, that customer base in it. Because now people want to talk. We all want to share our opinions. We all want to give our, our ideas and you know work with each other on making that project or that space better. There's no hierarchy anymore, right? In, in that sense, right? So, okay, to talk. Sure. I would say the problem too with uh, with, contra with if you commit to being controversial is you always having to keep up your game. And yeah. the problem is, if you up it just, if you just cross it, past that line, that it becomes true. brand suicide. Oh, like, yeah, yeah. like look at Logan Paul. That is he true. posted one YouTube video and totally destroyed his brand. That final line. Then using Pepsi, the Kendall Jenner ad went over the line a bit. They're still edgy. People still think of them, and it didn't really destroy them. But uh, they're like a multi-billion dollar. No, no, no. It's company. not. It's not even about that. Yeah. It's about Pepsi is known to do that. Yeah. that. So I don't know if you you were there when I started the presentation. I was like, the first question I asked did had did anybody see the Pepsi ad with the um, uh, Madonna thirty years ago? Yeah. Right when she did her like a prayer. At that point too, very very controversial for that for the nineteen eighties back then, but. It so they're known for pushing. They're, they're known, known for, for being with the trend, pushing that envelope. But if they screw up, then let let like see. Their trick is to say, "Oh my God, we didn't realize this. We're so sorry." Blah 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 blah. People will still love them because they will have these these trending commercials. So if they do make a controversial one, no one gets offended. Then Logan, to that level. But then Logan Paul commit, uh, basically exploited a suicide victim. Like but, you know, like um, you know, some I don't know if you know the Yeah, but that was just that was his shtick. How many people on YouTube are there because they need to do something more outrageous? Yeah, but that's the whole thing. But he took it too far. He crossed that sort of that threshold that people want. Yes. Sorry, I, I just Sorry. this person was like waiting. Sorry. <laughs> um, from a social media management standpoint, like mm -hmm. if, if you're someone who doesn't really like that, obviously, the, but it's, a, it's something that you have to. Uh, a bullet you have to bite, then you probably want to hire someone. What should you be looking for in terms of what that person can offer, what that company can offer you, especially if you're a small business or even, like I'm, I, want, I want to get more into my writing mm -hmm. and um, I know I have to, I've had my uh, social media brands, I've tried a little couple of things, nothing really took off, so I don't know if it's something I should outsource or if it's something that I should um, if I should, um, you know, just just kind of focus more on providing more content, but um, but it's all time consuming, right? So that's kind of the option of hiring a, a company or maybe a, a somebody. What should you be looking for? Someone who has a bit of PR experience, mm -hmm. because they can do all your copywriting and then they know how to sort of um, word things depending on what your brand brand di di uh, direction is. Someone who can play with the uh, social media skill apps, so like how to create those graphics for you so you don't have to do them. Mm -hmm. But but what you need to know though is what you want to convey and on which platform. Mm -hmm. So once you know that, and if you want to focus on let's say the writing and your and your other business tools, 
it doesn't have to, it, it could be a small company that you hire, it could be a team of, you know, um, social media experts who love being on your account and monitoring everything, who understand uh, your uh, data, your reach, your engagement, mm -hmm. but they should have those skills. But they have a bit of peer experience, they're very social, and they can also um, keep up with all the social media trends that's happening. Mm -hmm. And, and know how to brand your voice, right? Mm -hmm. Sorry, like know how to uh, reply using your tone mm -hmm. of your brand. That is key. Because yeah. anyone thinks that you do social media. Right. It's, it's amazing to see that. <laughs> Just going back before that, you know, how do you decide whether you actually need somebody else to do it or whether it's not just what you're doing just needs to be a tweet? Mm -hmm. How do you decide that? Yeah. I think that's going to depend on your growth and what your purpose is. So if you know your target market, let's say, is an Instagram-based target market, so then do you have the time on the weekend or during the week to sit and make your content for not only seven days a week, but at least, let's say, to post two times a week with all the research of, of your hashtags, which are key, which again has changed now, by the way. So we don't need like 30 hashtags on, on Instagram anymore. Um, can, can you make your videos on Instagram and post them? Or, like, or do you know how to use, how to use um, Twitter where you can have that conversation and you know like when to jump in a conversation when not to jump in a conversation? So that depends on your skill set. So you can say, okay, you know what, I need someone to help me out with this. And I'm going to look for someone who understands, let's say, Facebook better than you and I do. Because their ads become so sensitive when you play with it and uh, release it that if you don't know how to, like, how to do it, like, really well, it can screw up everything for you and your target market in your reach. And it's okay if you don't know how to do everything yourself, that's when you have other people who are experts in it and you're expert in your service and product, right? So that's how you would judge that. It's on your time. Sorry, yes. I, yeah, I, just going back to what you guys are saying, and it, social media does take a lot of time. If you're not, if you haven't been storytelling already, then that's one way I would consider just going outside. Uh, also, with all the, the platforms, it seems to be it seems to be a pay to play now. The, the organic reach now, it's not getting anywhere. So, it's hard. so you, you really have to have a um, some sort of pay to play. I think personally, for anyone that's working with a brand, I mean, even if you put five dollars, ten dollars, oh, that's nothing. It's going to help you. Just it's, it's nothing, but it's you're going to have to step yourself. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, and again, it depends on your platform. Because right? now um, everybody is competing for that one person's attention. So content is literally just being thrown out there every single day, every single moment. So you need to make sure that your content piece is is resonating and reaching to that audience that you want to. Right? Which is why some brands do the whole controversial, let me be the bad person type of you know face to get people talking about it. Because at the end of the day, you'll still think of Wendy's, right? That's the thing. At the end, going like if you want a breakfast sandwich, you, you will not go to McDonald's. You, you're going to probably stop at Wendy's on the way when you see it. Yeah. So that's what they're doing. So that, that's how pretty much works. So how long, how long does it take to build a brand online starting from zero? Let's say no personal, no professional presence. Mm -hmm. And what could be done to speed it up? So if you want to speed it up, yeah. you need someone who can help you create amazing content. So I would suggest take a weekend, get a get a photographer or a friend who loves taking pictures. Have an idea. So what you really need is to know what are you, what type of content are you gonna have out there? Will you have like quotes? Will you just have any videos? Will you have like candid shots? Like things like that. Get your photographer to create that content for you. So if you spend four, like like yeah, 48 hours literally having all those shots taken, having all those um, um, sets being made and taking those pictures or those videos and like like editing them, you slowly start pushing that content. But then a month later, you kind of just redo it again. You need another weekend. You need another weekend, <laughs> yes. It never stops. The, the minute you start storytelling, it, it doesn't mm -hmm. stop. And you have to keep up with the trend of it, of what's going on. And let's say you choose a platform like, like, like Facebook, for example. What you put on that page will be very different than what you will tweet to people out there. But you should be constantly on it to be able to reply to that person when they get to you right away. You have to be able to say, oh my god, this just happened. It is relevant to what I want to say. I need to like, like uh, speak about it. I need to make sure that my target audience is aware that this is important to my brand and to me. 
so they start engaging with you. It takes a little bit of time. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen overnight, and especially now with all the accounts, keeping their eye on you know fake accounts and followers and all that fun stuff. Even with paid uh, ads and boost posts, it still takes a lot of time because there's literally so much out there. Yeah. I would say video content, though, is your best bet if you're starting from scratch. You're just like, oh my god, no! <laughs> <laughs> that's, really, really, that's, that's what I was thinking. It's, it's video just, content. It's the most time-consuming aspect of it because it needs to be edited. But you have a lot of video apps. Do you have apps that do okay. it, but even yeah. with the apps, though, it's time consuming because then when you want to take a video, you have to know what you're taking a video of yeah. and how that's going to come. I'm a storyboarder then. And I do have a full time job, thankfully. Mm -hmm. But also, that doesn't give me much time for the fun activities. <laughs> so, I think that's everyone's story. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But like I said, it's giving up that weekend. It's taking that one weekend and just going about it nonstop. It's the only way if you want to be in that space, though, right? Can you speak a little bit about metrics? So what kind of metrics you use to judge your successes? So for me personally, right now I'm just going based on my. So for one of my clients, I because we have switched to that the Instagram of, um, business account, I can judge my metrics for my um, engagement uh, impressions, and for them it's also their uh, following. So what we started seeing with the type of content that, that we were pushing out, our followers started increasing so rapidly that Instagram thought that we were a fake account and they almost blocked us for a while. I had to deal with that. And then they were freaking out. But that's because like in a week we were getting like 170 followers just with the right hashtags and just pushing con uh, content out three times a day. That worked for us to the point we got shadow, shadow bond on Instagram, which just means that they will allow you to post but no one else can see it really. New, not new followers can see it. So how did you solve that? I had to wait two days, and then I had to appeal to Instagram and be like, "We're not a fake account. This is like, this is for real." And if you if you see our like uh, followers and our metrics and our impressions and our engagement, it's all real people. We just happen to focus on a niche market, and that's what worked for us. What was the market? Uh, wedding, like South, oh. uh, South Asian weddings. So we just focus on that. We, we spend time doing a bunch of photo shoots, and then I would sit for like three, four hours on a Sunday and use an Instagram planning tool, plan my entire storyboard out. So I would see every day how I want my like 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 feet to look, from the um, captions, color themes, how to like change it slowly, and that does take a lot of time. Just posting that stuff up and then releasing it takes a lot of time. So that was our, our situation. What, what app are you using to storyboard your Instagram? Uh, Planoli. Um, yeah, I, I like that. I can see everything and it shows our, our lives and our engagements and our comments if this worked or this didn't. So when you see the whole thing, you're like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Oh, wait, this looked beautiful. At some point, I'm like, oh my god, my feet look so sexy, guys. And like, don't touch it, don't touch it. <laughs> so yeah, so that's, it, it does help like when you see it like before you release it. Yeah. P-L-A-N-O-L-Y. Yeah. And you have it for um, iOS and uh, Android. So we're all covered this time. Yeah. <laughs> so in terms of your content for your for clients, one clients yeah. are you planning one month, two months? Like how much are you doing in advance? And uh, how much are you just kind of in the moment type of content? So it's very less like now with them it's very less in the moment content unless we know we're going for like certain events then it's planned and then even then we just put it on our stories that's so that's why i started using stories more now you can follow a hashtag so we'll go to this event we'll put our hashtag on our story people want to know more they end up following us just just uh, just, just through that but our actual um content feed we've We've taken you know weekends where we're just shooting a bunch of stuff, and then it's released slowly. How, how do you plan your, your your Instagram stories as part of your calendar? Though? As part of my calendar? Like, do you? I, I, I've I've done that. So what I would do is if I know like tomorrow I'm gonna post a certain type of let's say real wedding. Mm -hmm. So the day before on my Instagram story, I would crop that that image out to match my formatting. That is so key. Is is how you have your like um, uh, formats done, and I would just be like, you know, 
so excited for our big reveal tomorrow and stuff like that. So people are just following it, right? And the more followers you have, the more views you're getting. And when you check in your places, people around the area want to know what's going on. So that's my stories from my clients are usually planned as well, unless we're going to an event. And even when we are at an event, we know we're going there. This is what we plan to do. On my own personal account, I really don't pay that much attention, so I just don't end up having the time after doing it for everybody else. It's like, yeah, like I really don't care. But then when I do it on my own um, stories, with, even though I don't have a very high personal following, I still get a lot of views. So. Yeah, Instagram stories is big. It's just amazing how, I don't know how like, everyone here, but it's just totally, like Twitter, Twitter used to be the, no one talks about Twitter now, which I still think is a great tool, but it's great tool, Instagram yeah. stories has just been blowing up. Oh yeah, I, I, I find it better than Snapchat either. Yeah. You can follow those hashtags, you can actually then end up having conversations and uh, people find you just based on your location and what you're doing. And also depends on your demographics, right? Like, I think the, when I say older generation, I mean like us, we prefer that over Snapchat. So that's just in general for everyone's different. Um, what's the what's the new the new social media that's coming up on the horizon? Is there anyone, or do they even matter with uh, how big uh, Instagram is? Or I think people are just focusing more on Instagram and Instagram stories and video content. So what's going to happen is that YouTube and Instagram stories are going to be more than anything, mm. and then the other brands will be competing because no one's really fallen in love with the change on Snapchat, mm. but people want to take videos. And YouTube still dominates that, that field. So, yeah. To add to that, I think um, what's coming, I feel, is uh, Facebook groups is yes. coming up. Yes. And also, most people use the uh, like WhatsApp. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm try you have to try to see where people are talking. Mm -hmm. And most of the people where they're talking now, they're, they're tired of the, of the Twitter. You just mentioned you're tired of the Facebook. But these, like, these groups, you're getting a lot of engagement in these groups because it's basically people who have the same interests talking about the same thing the whole time. It's crazy how much interaction you get in those groups. Facebook groups have, have, have always worked though, because depending on what field you are in, there's all these groups out there, especially if you're in arts and uh, entertainment. So many groups to find, like based on your uh, location of like what you want to do and what you want to hire and who you want to hire and who you want to intern and all that stuff. Facebook groups works amazing for that. But in terms of a trend, in, in pushing your brand and content out there, it would still be Instagram and YouTube. Yeah. Although I think it depends too on the demographics. You're right. Like the example I use, if you wanted to, I don't know, push uh, home care for seniors, mm -hmm. Snapchat would not No, be absolutely not. Like, but Facebook would probably be the best social media platform to push that because kind they of, are comfortable with that platform. You don't probably find Instagram. older people or whatever yes. who, you know, who resonate with. Oh yeah, my, my parents use Facebook more than anything. And I'm just like, oh God. We're still not friends on Facebook, and that's how it's going to be. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. as, a, as a writer, somebody who's in maybe not the most visual um, uh, field, what would you suggest in terms of, like, especially Instagram, which is a purely visual social media? It's purely media. visual, but a lot of writers and poets still use Instagram a lot. Because so what they do is they're putting their poetry um, on a visual background. Mm -hmm. So it still appeals and then people read it. Mm -hmm. Instead of having a big long caption with a really short caption, mm -hmm. but what you want to convey is on your post. Mm -hmm. But not in the big flashy boxing day sale type of thing, more like a beautiful font, you know, a nice background. And that and that appeals to someone's eye. So Instagram actually works better than even um, Facebook for that stuff. Yeah, I know. It, it, it's weird, but yeah. it, it actually does work a lot better. Um, what was I going to say? Uh, I don't know. I'll, I'll think of it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Any other topic, uh, topics? Yeah, I'll talk, 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 conversations. We're all good. I'm going to ask a question, and since it's got an audience here, Absolutely. I'm trying to target an older market. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of uh, fashion, so I'm wondering, where the heck are these people that are the, the, the older generation? Where, how do I get them on social if they're not usually on social? If that makes sense. So, how old are we talking? 
I'm, I'm talking 45 and up. Okay. So basically, I'm trying to target people who used to shop at Sears. Okay. So I'm trying to. So I wanted to know. Maybe someone from the audience, like they might know something, or they, like I'm trying to figure out where to target these type of people. I think we're we're on social media. Mm -hmm. It's just how to find us. The question is how to find anybody. Where do you actually find their actual audience? So do you have a tip about that in general? Because it's like uh, everybody I know, including people in their 70s and 80s, are on social media. So some social, yeah. There's so they're many. usually on Facebook more than Instagram because older generation actually do find harder to use Instagram unless they are one of those very rare but extremely tech savvy and they're, and they're they were there when it started. So and and, and they, they know how to use, you know, all the um, uh, photo apps and video apps and stuff and they have the time and patience for it. Which which we do have that group out there. It's just not as generalized. Um, they are on Facebook because they they know how to use that. They it's easier for them to adopt to that change. WhatsApp it'll never be the best for marketing because that's your private conversation with your friends and your family, and people want to keep it that way. WhatsApp did cr did try to have that like that you know like like where you have groups and people targeted and all that stuff, and it, it failed horribly. Like nobody wants when they're talking to their friends to get a message about. Hey, you know, bed mattresses are on sale for so and so because they, they, they get it all the time. So it would be a, like Facebook is where your, your um, audience is, but it's also going to be at um, community events. That's where your audience is going to be. Yeah, and for sorry, and for audience research, you actually have to take the time, and that's another weekend of yours. That's another go, <laughs> and you need to actually go through all social media platforms so like when you read those hashtags if you if, if if one of them applies to what you're going click on it then start doing that research and you will find your audience through that same thing with facebook like go on all those facebook groups and you have all you have so many like you name that topic and it's out there on facebook i'm i'm in a bunch that i've not even like responded to because it's just stuff that like um resonates with all of it there if you're for you know jobs and opportunities and you want to connect with the with, with the professional network, LinkedIn with the LinkedIn groups. That actually works a lot. So it's really just taking that weekend and saying I'm gonna do my PJs and have my coffee and tea and not meet people and just not leave my laptop computer. So yeah. And my cards are right there, so if you guys want to talk to me also afterwards, if you guys have questions, let's in two, three days, think of something, please connect for sure.